Hmm. Good afternoon. Has everybody had a good lunch? Yeah? Everybody happy? Everybody awake? Is the appropriate bottle of water, cup of coffee? Brief moment, I need to grab my ice. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do in this presentation is, of course, what the presentation says, but what I'm going to do first is check who here um, is actually an educator, as in is a Specifically, a teacher in a primary or a high school, or maybe university. Hmm? Not necessarily, but let's let's start with the paid. Anyone? Anyone? Because I know there are some people around. Okay, they're not in the room at the moment. I don't see their faces. One. Okay, um, and I do sometimes go into school as well. Now, um, okay, so. Other background, IT backgrounds, obviously. How many of you would consider yourself actual programmers? Okay, so that's most of you. Excellent. Okay, then I know the then I know the context. So what I'm going to do along the way here is actually update you programming geeks about the national curriculum um, and how schools actually work. And um, because that may not be the way you think it does. Um, and this is all purely Australian. I can't actually speak for any other country, but I would be quite surprised if certain things worked, didn't work in very similar ways because of the way the processes work. And um, I'll also run you through the digital tech curriculum that is, that is available. You may not have seen anything in particular other than what happens in the media and what, uh, what politicians think they know about it. So first of all, I'd like to give you a nice example of invalid use of technology. Have a think about this one. And Roland already touched it this morning. Roland said, I still make notes in a paper notebook. Is, is, am I old fashioned? Am I not up with the times? Actually, for whatever reason, he's actually made the right decision. So people at conferences, I see a laptop closing now, well done. Um, if you make notes on your laptop, and this is, as I said, being tested, you can read the paper. Um, if you make the notes on your laptop, and um, even if you read them later and, and review them or whatever, your attention will be less than someone who hasn't taken any note at all. As to what the reasons are for that, we can have a discussion about that, but you know, you can have ideas. You might be distracted with what you're actually doing there on the keyboard. If you were to write down, it's a completely different thing. And the interesting thing is that if you grab a piece of paper and you write down the notes, you scrunch up the piece of paper and you toss it away, your attention is still better. Interesting, isn't it? So take that as a fact and play with it. Um, what some schools now do is they might have tablets and they might have tablets with styluses. And they encourage um, doodling and note taking and someone might live draw, for instance, a mind map. And they don't necessarily use a particular tool other than using the, the tablet as a, as a big piece of paper. So they might be drawing while the conversation is going on, and that of course does work because they're actually using the, the hand to, to write and draw. So that actually does benefit, but they're not typing. Apparently there's something in our brain where typing is not the same as writing. It doesn't connect. So just to, to give you that idea. And this ties back of course to how computers are used in schools. Because giving everybody in the classroom a, a, a laptop and making them take notes on the computer doesn't actually improve the learning. In fact, you decrease the learning effect. Isn't that interesting? So, now for the Australian curriculum. Um, it has existed for, for a, couple of, a couple of years. This is specifically the digital tech component in version 8 of the curriculum. We're now at version 8.3, I think. There's, there's yearly updates where actually very little is changed. Some slight wording tweaks, Sometimes two curriculum codes are merged into one. Sometimes the description is slightly improved. Um, it's, it's tiny little bug fixes, okay? Um, ACARA is the national curriculum organization, which is actually, it's somewhat independent from, um, from the education department. It's, some, it, it's run by a representative from the federal education system. It's also, um, there's also people from each of the states involved, okay? So 
it's a bit of an independent body. Of course, they're subject to what the, the Federal Education Minister does. The outcomes from ACARA are actually remarkably sane. Yeah? Whichever political angle you are at, there's actually very little nasty stuff in there on whatever angle. Um, so that's actually a good sign. That doesn't mean that the materials in the classroom is good, interesting, not warped, whatever, but that's not the curriculum's fault. That is someone taking those curriculum codes, implementing them in actual classroom material and, and teaching units, and doing something funky with it based on their ideology or agenda or whatever. Okay, just to get that clear. Now, in terms of digital technologies, from prep to eight or foundation or whatever you call it, it's the, the year before level, year one. It, it is called something differently in every state. What's it called in New Zealand? <laughs> Okay, so what's it called? What's it called? What, what comes before year one? Yeah, but what comes before year one? It is a year one. Okay? Year zero. Okay. In Queensland, it's prep. In New South Wales, I forget what it is. Uh, kindy, I think. Um, okay, so the national curriculum has figured out that everybody has a different name for it. They call it foundation because they couldn't make all the states agree, so they call it something else. Um, <laughs> just so you know, when you're reading the stuff, all this stuff, when you, when you search, up, uh, search a car online, you will actually see the whole thing online. It is actually possible to get a digital version and download it. It's available in RDF uh, format. That's pretty slick, hey? And um, sometimes there's also extra, um, like Excel dumps from it. You can easily play with it. And you can now actually output that to CSV files they load it in the database. It's actually workable. It's machine readable if you want it. So from prep, I'll just call prep or foundation, to year eight, um, the digital curriculum is supposed to be um, mandatory and it will be an elective from year nine onwards. So in early high schools, which is year seven and eight, it should be mandatory. But individual states and territories are implementing it. So it's not for the federal government to implement a curriculum specification. That is up to each individual state. So what a state does is create a state curriculum. Now that sounds way more fancy than it is. They all are doing it completely differently. Which means that if you look at the Queensland curriculum, and there are differences, I can pretty much assure you that it's a cut and paste error. Yeah? New South Wales does lay things out a little bit differently and sometimes has its own curriculum codes in the blocks that they do. WA does similar things. Again, Victoria does slightly different layouts in terms of what type of strands get used. But essentially, they're all very, very similar. Um, in the Queensland curriculum, I've spotted a particular curriculum code, like a whole little section of, we should be learning about this, um, not being in there, where in the Australian curriculum, I did see it. That code is just missing. I'm still convinced that that's a cut and paste error because it was no particular topic. It fit into everything else. It didn't have a reason to not be there, even for political reasons. So cut and paste error. So that gives you a bit of perspective how it actually works. It is not as complicated as it looks, but you have to cut through the, the silly. In terms of programming, programming gets taught, and we'll look at what it actually looks like in a moment. From year three to four, once a... Um, a state gets to that point, and I'll make another point about that in a moment, and a bit more in year five, six. So in the year three, four description, there's a suggestion for using visual programming environments. I don't particularly know why that suggestion is made, but the committee that worked on this put that in. We can discuss that more later. From year seven onward, the reference is a general purpose programming language, and depending on which version you read, there is a, there is a line that says, such as Python. Pretty reasonable because Python is a general purpose programming language. So, you know, I can go with that. Year 9 plus says object oriented. Interesting. I thought Python, can we agree that Python is already an object oriented language from the moment you start typing something? Um, kind of. You might not use it per se in that context, but it is that language. Yeah? So, isn't that interesting? But, you know, this is the thought that came in. However, very important, these are hints. These are not thou shalt, okay? So when the curriculum talks about these things in, in the little descriptions, this is not in the main description, it is in the extra 
in the extra information, which gives you a bit of a guideline, but you don't strictly have to adhere to that. You could do something else. And that's very important when you do think. Now, what's happening in the States is the state comes up with that, their own curriculum version, which, as I mentioned, is often a cut and paste job, which is fine as long as they do it. And um, then the different education departments need to implement that. So in Queensland, there's Education Queensland, which has a set of um, programs called Curriculum to the Classroom. And that is what they build as the, let's say, the sample or the fault that state schools can use. Non-state schools also have access to that in many cases, but the Catholic system uses their own thing and independent schools and other private schools use their own things as well. So in many cases, a teacher in a Catholic school, for instance, a year five teacher in a Catholic school, might actually build their own teaching units for different subjects by assembling different materials that they, that they compile together with, um, with, teacher, or with other teachers um, in, uh, in their school or within their cluster, like the city that they work in or another working group. Um, it doesn't have to be something that is mandated by, by the state. A, any state school is also able to do essentially whatever they like as long as they tick off those curriculum items. So they don't have to use the curriculum to classroom materials in Queensland. They don't have to use the state designed material in WA Victoria or wherever. Okay? So individual schools, even state schools, have that degree of freedom. However, they do, of course, get that state material essentially for free and other materials like the one that my own companies uh, develop um, might cost something. So that might be a bit of a hindrance. However, you know, there, there might be different aspects to making those decisions. So that gives you a bit of idea what the context there is. So this is what the actual curriculum looks like. Um, I don't expect you to take it all in. I can make sure you get a copy. It's also downloadable from the Akara site. But this page and the next page is essentially the entire digital tech curriculum. Interesting, isn't it? It's only two pages. So it isn't actually that, that elaborate or complicated. Um, you will also notice that there's not an awful lot of programming. And that's actually very interesting because when you look in the media, it's all about all oh, kids must learn to code. Well, not against that, but that's not actually what the curriculum is talking about. And getting back to the, actual, the earlier conversation about STEM, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, another thing my, my company does um, is we have a, an integrated program that does history, geography, science, um, and, and other aspects of the social sciences plus science. We had an open day where various schools came, came to us and, and had, a, had a chat and looked at the different materials. We're talking with teachers and, and the principal of a school that was already implementing this. And one nearby school came over, looked at this history and geography material and said, this is not STEM. Excuse me? Well, it's not STEM. This is history. It's not STEM. Oh, says my wife, who is an archaeologist, how, how does that work for you? And um, they didn't get on the same page, I have to say. Um, STEM for them had a very particular meaning. They they'd essentially developed it in a whole... Please put that on quiet, whatever that is. Can we kill that computer? It's starting up Windows. Seven. Okay. Believe me, my computer does not make that noise. <laughs> Pure Linux, I, trust me. Okay, um, Windows is okay, we'll get back to that. So what happened is though that school had essentially got it, let's say bluntly, into their head that STEM was a subject. And that is actually how they worked it into their timetable. Next to English, math, maths, history and geography and other things that happened in the timetable, they now also had an item called STEM. And they were doing stuff. Coding might be part of that or particular other projects. And we found this quite astonishing, but you know, you kind of have these things, take these things at face value. You're not going to convince them at that point in time, being an unknown third party interacting with them, you're not going to convince them that they might be doing things entirely the wrong way. Actually doing really, really cool stuff. Unfortunately, they're not integrating it with all the other work they're doing. The interesting thing about the history geography program was that those kids that were doing that program were actually in the higher years using, using the scientific method of actually 
um, you know, laying out an issue that they wanted to explore, working on a hypothesis, gathering data, doing analysis of the data, having a critical assessment of the data. They were doing the scientific process the way you're supposed to do it in university. And they were doing this in primary school. Were they doing STEM learning? Absolutely. Bloody that is exactly what they were doing, which was way more than what many other classes are doing. So it's just a different way of looking at it, but it makes for a very interesting perspective here. So, you know, this kind of stuff in year three, four. Define problems, describe and follow a sequence of steps and decisions. Um, that one's actually very interesting because, again, it's actually not got anything to do with coding. It's about thinking about problems and problem solving. It's nothing even to do with computers. It's what we do in the real world. It actually ties in, when you look at the curriculum, it ties in with something that is taught in year one English. It's called procedures, known to you and me as recipes. Um, it's a, I have this problem, I need to get from A to B, I want to make a batch of chocolate chip cookies. It's a nice example that the kids like. And, you know, we need to put the different ingredients together in a particular, it's booted again. <laughs> um, you put the different ingredients together in a certain order, mixing them up in the correct way in certain steps, and then you add new ingredients, you put it in the oven and so on. You need to do those steps in the proper order, otherwise it's not going to work. If you put the tray into the oven first and then you add the ingredients, it's not going to fly. It's, the first step is really important to have before the second step. So that is year one English, where this is covered. Um, and they do a lot of games with that, and some of it might be recipe related. They do, you know, how do you brush your teeth? You know, you put the toothpaste on first, and it's just a fun thing. Essentially, can we agree, they're actually doing programming as well. Because this is exactly what you do in computer programming. It's one step after another. Isn't that cool? So, I actually use this example with teachers who are sometimes really uncomfortable with that idea of coding, and saying, okay, you know that year, that year one English stuff, you've already taught coding, you just didn't realize. It's a different way of looking at the same thing. Um, so, yeah, as you see, I mean, would, would anybody like to, to pick out one thing and, and have a comment on, on that? What, what sticks out to you as something particularly interesting or curious or, yeah, any? Yeah, sure. Let's just do one and I'll go on to the next slide. Yep. Um, I'll point second, it out at the later. Row, first that one? Yep. That's the level of, of abstraction that we have fun trying to get primary school students to comprehend. Yeah, so this is six to, well, about five to seven, eight year olds. They're supposed to be working on that. Um, the, true, um, but it doesn't say to what, in this context, it doesn't say to what depth that is required. So it's getting started with certain aspects. I mean, when we're starting coding, we're not doing whole complex things. We're, we're starting at some level. But yes, it, it, you can see from that little description that that is actually the only bit that the curriculum actually mandates in that way. You can't actually tell an awful lot, and you can reinterpret it in any direction you like. And this is why the media can run with this, or politicians, and they might get the wrong end of various sticks. Um, so this is part of the story. This is the other part of the story. Same years, it's just the second part of the same page, essentially. Okay? And here, there's a little bit more focus on the programming bit. I've marked it. Do I still? I have a... There. Coding. I've put that in. Okay. So it's called implementing. And then you get into that. I'm still not convinced that we actually need computers to do many of those things. But if we do, that is actually the only thing that is mandated by the curriculum. Okay, so years three and four, implement simple digital solutions, and then here as visual programs, but that's just a hint that's made clear elsewhere, with algorithms involving branching decisions and user input. But heaven beware, you're not supposed to use a loop because that is year five and six, yeah? So don't use loops before you, okay, just, yeah, okay. Um, and and using, using Python in primary school, well, yeah, the, the, I'm, I'm of course making fun, but using Python in primary school is, if you read this strictly, not recommended because you're supposed to do that in year seven and, and, and upward. Okay, so again, you can take it really strictly and go silly, but for people who are really not 
informed about programming and, and trying to get to grips with it, this can change you in funny directions. And, oh, we must now teach everybody coding. That's not what it's about. We need to teach people to think. Um, anyway, this gives you a bit, a, a bit of idea. You know, again, it, it looks very complicated. You know, manage the creation and communication of ideas and information using online collaborative projects, applying agreed ethical, social, and technical protocols. They might be sharing a Google Doc. Um, they could be looking at pictures on Twitter. I don't know, but, um, you know, it, it, it's not something particularly complicated. It's just written down in a very complicated fashion. The good thing is there's nothing here that describes what kind of technology actually needs to be used, other than those words visual and, and, uh, and, and, and general purpose programming languages and that kind of thing, uh, but that's only an extra hint. Um, it doesn't say use this particular technology. It doesn't say, yeah, say use iPads. It doesn't say use Windows. That's all good, right? So that's, that's pretty decent. Anyway, gives you a bit of a background for, for the non-teachers among us, what, what the teachers are actually indirectly dealing with. In the end, they have to comply with that. Whatever local stuff actually happens, that is what they're actually needing to adhere to properly. Okay. Sure, I'll go back. They didn't say it like that. That was what I derived. Yes, okay. Yes. Good question. Okay. So the question is, I'll, I'll echo the question back for the, for the camera. The question is, is the digital technologies curriculum regarded as a subject? And should it be taught separately? Or do we do other things with it? The Australian curriculum doesn't specify how things are taught. It just gives an overview of by what year level certain concepts and, and skills should be covered and you know, um, started to learn being more advanced in it and then being comfortable with over, over the years. It's a build up, it's scaffolding because you can't do complicated things until you deal with the, you know, you can't run until you can walk, that kind of thing. Um, Digital tech does not need to be taught as a separate subject. Similarly, history and geography does not need to be taught as separate subjects. In fact, when you talk about the history, you're generally dealing with geography, even if you pretend it doesn't. And then when you later discover a similar time period in history, you're dealing with geography, even if you're not talking about geography. It makes sense to combine it. Our materials combine it. Um, as I mentioned, the history, geography, some other things, and, and science together, because it fits really nicely. But for Queensland schools, that is a new thing. In New South Wales, and also Victoria, it's not new at all. In fact, the New South Wales curriculum says very explicitly, the history and geography curricula are very suited to integration. I might get the exact phrasing wrong, but that's what it, what it says. And what they mean is, it just naturally goes together, it makes sense. And that means also that you don't have to spend a lot of extra time on it. You can cover them together. You spend a little bit more time than you would just covering one subject, but you save a lot of time compared to covering it all separately. So covering that bit about what I mentioned with procedures and programming in year one, covering the digital tech aspect in English makes perfect sense. And other aspects of digital tech will fit in mathematics. I don't think it should be taught as a separate subject. And the reason for that is that, you know, any new technology gets put in a separate thing. You learn IT. We now don't learn IT. It's now a tool. We understand it. It's kind of been incorporated into our society. I don't think it's a good thing to see it as a separate thing. IT is used as part of English, mathematics, science, all the other aspects. We might look up things online. We might use a spreadsheet to, to um, you know, to put in some data and make a graph from that. And kids actually learn that and, and creating graphs is part of the curriculum um, description. So, you know, you can tick off some of the digital tech stuff while you're doing something else. If you see it separately, you're actually taking on a lot of extra work. Unfortunately, when you look at the curriculum to classroom material, for instance, there's a separate history unit, separate geography unit, and now trying to combine them. Um, digital tech, again, is a separate module. I don't think it needs to be, but it takes an awful lot of work and years for them to, to do that. The digital tech materials that we have integrate with the English and maths. Because that's like a natural match 
seemingly for the, uh, for the curriculum, okay? All right, quickly on. Um, I just want to put this one in. This one I discuss with, with teachers and, and just schools in general, and this is essentially the, the discussion of the argument against using open source or trying different things. And um, again, Roland touched on, on, on some of it. Um, when you're talking about astronomy, we're not talking, you know, it, it, it's only partially about, about telescopes. Um, telescopes is a tool. The, the issue with, with products and, and um, the slides will be made available, but feel free to make photos. Um, <laughs> so many schools, of course, standardize on, let's say, Microsoft Office. That's just very common, and that's what people are comfortable with. I'll shortly explain why people are comfortable with that because there's a fairly straightforward um, reason for that. However, we need to be very aware of that, let's call it a brain warp. When I learned to drive, I learned to drive a car. I didn't learn to drive a particular brand of car, a particular model of car. And when you look at the differences, for instance, let's take Microsoft Office and, and LibreOffice as, as good examples of fairly mature open source and proprietary products. They're actually very similar. The menus and icons look slightly different. But what you can see is that the difference between one version and the next version of Microsoft Office is often actually greater than the difference between Microsoft Office and LibreOffice. Does that make sense? So if you were to step sideways, you're actually doing less of a retraining than stepping to the next, next version. And people still reckon they need training to get comfortable with the next version. And that is because they're not getting taught word processing or using a spreadsheet. They get taught very specifically, let's say the monkey steps on press this button, press that button, that, that button, to do a particular task in that particular version. And that means that they're not actually understanding what they're doing in the concept of a spreadsheet or a word processor, which means they can't translate or naturally they can't translate naturally from what they've learned there to the generic understanding of how the product works and then they can apply it to a new version. And I think that is very important to distinguish. If you learn a skill and a concept rather than a particular version of a product, then that skill is generally applicable and that's a different way of teaching. We don't want to be teaching people to use a particular version of anything, not of any open source tool either. We'd like them to have that skill. A person, you and I and any kid, at least teenagers, should be able to open any word processor and find their way around. Be able to write a document, highlight some stuff, put some headings in and press on the, uh, save the stuff and, and, and print it. You know, that should be possible. However, that is not currently what happens and that is an issue. Um, so that's, that's just that aspect there. Um, oh, uh, what I was going to mention here, a test has been done in South Australia, and this is over a decade ago. Um, two, I'm not sure whether it was done at university or, or high school level, in any case, two classes in parallel, and I do have the reference somewhere if you, you ask me later. Um, two classes in parallel, um, and they were using, I think, um, the GNU Image Manipulation Program, GIMP, and um, Photoshop. And one class would use the one, and the other class would use the other one. And then after a term or a couple of weeks, they'd swap. So they were learning the same thing, the same skills, but they were using a different tool set. And after a while, they would swap tool sets. Does that make sense? So what do you think the outcome is from this particular experiment? Any ideas before I tell you the secret? Anyone? Interesting. Okay, so the, the suggested answer is that unfortunately for open source, um, both, both sides may have, may have preferred um, Photoshop at the end. Okay, I'll take that suggestion. Yep. Okay, so here's a second suggestion. Where, whichever tool they were using, when they switched, they felt uncomfortable with the new tool. I'll, I'll leave it there because I need, to, I need to move on. The second answer is absolutely correct. 
the Photoshop thing didn't matter. That was completely irrelevant as per the outcome. Whatever tool they were using first, they were most comfortable with. They were very able to use the other tool. There was just great discomfort with the change. Humans don't like change. Yeah? Change in processes, change in tools, it is not comfortable. Yes, Florian? Um, you said when you started with this, yes. you frequently have, have had discussions with teachers about this. Yeah, yeah. What did you hear from teachers about this? What, what, what is their opinion? I think I should get back to that. Okay. But there's, a gen there's general discomfort, and, and I'll, I'll explain the discomfort and the reasoning for that. As I mentioned, I might make you cry during this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, the state of Australian education. Now, education is critically important. We can all agree on that. Whichever political angle you might have if you're interested in politics. However, in Australia, it's often talked that, oh, it costs these many billions. That's not what it's about because it's an investment. When you, and the same applies to the MBN, of course, our national broadband network, um, the, the way of communicating about it in politics and in the media is completely incorrect. What is the economic benefit of connecting you to a main road and a water pipe and electricity? Anyone? What's, what economic benefit does the state get out of that? Productivity, yes. So it's very indirect. That road outside your house is not a profitable business. We call it infrastructure. NBN is infrastructure. Education is a service, acts in the same way. Healthcare does actually the same thing as education. It's a service. If you don't do it, it's going to cost you somewhere else. If you don't do education, it's going to cost you somewhere else. If you don't have proper roads, and not necessarily more roads, but proper roads, if you don't have proper roads, people can't get from A to B. They are not able to interact with each other, run businesses, and so on. If you don't have running water, all kinds of things go wrong. Okay? So there's a lot of focus on measurable outcomes, particularly in literacy and numeracy. And that means that for school, if the NAPLAN results, which are standardized tests on literacy, it's the National Assessment Program for, liter uh, for Literacy and Numeracy. That's NAPLAN. If the test results in a particular year level drop, the school goes in a complete panic and they will then drop whatever they were doing and focus on raising it. Funnily enough, that actually drops standards. We can discuss later why that might be, but it's just a fact that we can now know. Hmm? The, government does the, same thing. the government does exactly the same thing. I'm, yes, okay, I'm just noting it here so we're all on the same page. Okay, so the consequence is that teaching starts happening towards assessments towards producing particularly grades that look good because the regional director might ask the principal who might ask the teacher how that might actually operate. The terminology per state might differ, but that's the idea. This also means that if a particular assessment doesn't contain certain curriculum topics because they don't necessarily assess everything, the teaching of those topics that are not assessed may drop off the table. And I'm not kidding. Aspects of the curriculum are now not getting taught bits of units do not get taught and that doesn't show up in the same year level because you know that kind of hides however the scaffolding will be absent it's like i should have made a photo at home of this you all know the game jenga try and take a lot of those blocks away this is how we're teaching our kids right now because the teachers are so stressed out yeah so whole lots of scaffolding are are missing which means that when when in the next year level you're trying to use the underlying skill, the underlying skill is missing. But teachers kind of have to do this because they're time crunched and, yeah? Okay, so let's get this clear. Teachers are awesome and they're doing an absolutely fabulous job in very, very difficult circumstances. Let's get that straight. But that, okay? Teachers in Australia are seen as a generic resource, potentially even replaceable by tech. And that I find a bit freaky because a teacher, an actual real life competent teacher is not the same as an online service. Yeah? They're hideously undervalued as a concept. They're overloaded, busy, stressed. They're underpaid. Other countries pay teachers very highly and I think we should try doing the same, same with nurses. Um, now in primary schools, most are non-specialist. That means they don't know a lot about any particular topic, the generalist. That's fine, just a fact, okay? Just to get that straight. In high schools, 
they're organized into departments. And of course, the maths department can't be doing science at the same time because that encroaches on their time and there's a science department. They could work together, but that's a bit of a tricky thing sometimes, so just to give you an idea. Predominantly, I'll be really blunt here, teachers are functionally tech illiterate. They are not actually often able to open a file browser and copy a file from, a, from somewhere in the directory to a USB stick without getting lost somewhere. And that is just a fact. You can observe that when you, when you talk to a teacher. And that's not their fault, but it is a fact. So when we're talking about let's teach kids how to code or other bits of digital tech, we need to appreciate that we're actually talking about digital literacy. And the first thing we need to do is have the teachers be comfortable with those digital technologies before we start teaching t kids to code. All we need to do it differently because these teachers are so stressed. When you're stressed, you're not going to be taking on board, oh, let's change to this particular tool. Let's try this newfangled stuff for which you need to spend more time at night. Teachers work so many hours, it's not funny, and they don't get paid for it. They work in weekends, they work in holidays, they work at nighttime. They come to school at 7 a.m. and they leave school after 4 or 5 p.m. It is not nice, and often there's a long commute as well, okay? So, I'll quickly run you through this. You can, you can read, I don't need to, I don't need to scan this all for you, but you get the idea, yeah? It's very locked down. It's like a big enterprise environment, except it's distributed. That's not an easy environment to work with if we're thinking digital tech and implementing programming, okay? Next. There is some open source out there. So it's not an anti-open source environment per se, but they've standardized on Windows and, or, or in some cases Apple, okay? There's no admin or root access. So the moment I start installing libraries and, and tools, I get a problem. I need to ask someone from the department to come in and the school can, can ask for that. Their schools at primary schools don't have their own dedicated IT person. They're contracted, they're not even education department. Um, they're contracted, they come in once or twice a week. It gets indirectly billed through the, for the school and they can install stuff and you give them a bit of instruction. They're pretty bright people, they're pretty good and they're nice to work with. Some of them don't have root access themselves, some do. So they can change certain things in the Active Directory environment, they can't change everything. They don't have pure access, okay? So you need to be aware of the restrictions they operate under. It's a very locked down environment, everybody is in layers there. So if I install Python, I don't necessarily have all the libraries I need. And while there's a project going on, someone finds this cool library online and is unable to install it. And we can whinge about that, but that's a fact now. Unless we do these computers differently, it's not going to change. If people save code, they can either stick it on their USB stick or stick it on the D drive. The D drive is only local. It is not going to be back. It might be backed up onto the network, but it doesn't proper, it's not their home drive that is network mounted. It doesn't have own cloud, which copies it to the network and then downloads again to the other laptops. Yeah? So when they log in on another laptop, that D drive is still there, but it doesn't contain their data from the other laptop. Interesting, isn't it? I don't have time right now, we'll get to this. Oh, so again, this just gives you an overview of what we're dealing with. Internet connectivity, let's be blunt, it sucks insufficient bandwidth. And no, schools do not all have fiber, and no, they don't all have NBN, and the ones that do have NBN are no better off than the others, okay? Long reach, which is in the far out north and <laughs> in the far, let's say, bluntly out back, um, beats Chermside, which is a Brisbane outer, you know, outer suburb in terms of bandwidth. Longreach happens to have a very nice connection now. I think they were treated first with proper connectivity for MBN. Chermside hasn't, so their connectivity sucks. Um, this has the bottom one I know from someone in Ed Queensland. They had a meeting at the Gold Coast, but there were people in Brisbane who couldn't come to that meeting. It was actually quicker, and they did this literally. They had a presentation from early in the day. They stuck it on a USB stick, dropped it in a taxi, and sent the taxi to the Gold Coast for $100 because it got there on time, where downloading the video at the Gold Coast didn't achieve that. Yeah? It's the old, you can't beat the truckload full of floppies argument. That's what we're dealing with, yeah? So let's do this great online video system. No, please don't. So I'm getting really critical with, with technology because anytime you try to use technology, you're hunting against this, these problems, okay? Sometimes it's good to touch stuff. Many kids are very tactile and they need to touch things. So putting something on a screen picks up some kids and drops a whole lot of others. You can't do it instead of physical touch. So 
So moving around the room and actually touching stuff, doing things in the real world is actually really important. Making everything virtual, virtual reality is what, what Roland is showing. That's really great, but it's not the only thing that you can move to. It's an augmentation, not a replacement. And the actual benefit of online resources are so many websites like Mathletics and Learning Ladder and all these, thi all these things, or Study Ladder. Um, they're great, but you do need an internet connection to make it work. Now, with I think what I mentioned earlier, it takes between 5 and 15 minutes sometimes to log into the computer. Imagine being an 8 or 10-year-old kid. By that time, you've completely lost your patience, interest, you're frustrated. You're not going to be paying attention the rest of the hour. It's not going to work. And what if the internet connection actually completely fails or the computer doesn't log in? The lesson doesn't happen? Can't happen, because you have a limited amount of time and it needs to, those lessons need to be taught. So relying on that tech is actually a very dangerous thing to do for local schools. So many schools are now, or in teachers, just as a coping mechanism, are trying to avoid tech. Okay? Who knows what environment we're talking about? It's this multi-threaded multi event-driven programming for 8 to 12-year-olds. Nope. Hmm? Close. Yes. I'm talking scratch. And I've phrased it like this on purpose, because this is what scratch is. Yeah? The sprites in scratch, on every one of those screens, you have little blocks of code. Each of those blocks is essentially a thread. Each individual sprite has their own tab, which again has their own chunks of code. That means you're doing multi-threaded programming. Now, would you recommend teaching anyone who is new to programming to do multi-threaded programming? Stick up your hand now. Yeah. Really? <coughs> you're really comfortable with that? That's how humans think. Really? We think you're, ma you're male like me. My goodness, what are you pretending to do? <laughs> we can't actually multitask. Yes, it is. The race conditions are awesome. Okay, thank you, Andrew. The race conditions are awesome. Okay, so what do we need? Debugging skills, right? Now, I've helped my high school kids with the debugging of this scratch environment, and so have you. However, now think back to the teachers I was discussing and see what state they're in at that time. This is not a good idea. I'm not saying scratch is a dreadful thing, but we need to know, we need to understand what we're actually dealing with here. And it's a highly dangerous environment. If you simplify what you're actually doing with it, I think it's okay. And yes, there are rules for that. We can set it up. We can actually improve how people interact with Scratch by going to getting together and building a bit of things. That's fine. But what we actually need to deal with is teaching people, and that includes some of the teachers, those things. You've already read them, so I don't need to read them out for you. Okay? That's what we're actually wanting to learn. And then whether you're doing programming or walking around in the real world, that's perfectly fine, okay? Just scanning through these. Electronic materials for, for schools, impractical DRM, high cost. And this goes into up to $100,000 for, let's say, a school with about 1,700 students, high school. That gives you an idea of the level of cost. And then how many high schools do we have in Australia? It is huge. It's a big problem. So many of them opt to not do electronic versions of textbooks. The system is wrong there. It's, I've, I've put in here, it's kind of the education space equivalent of the Motion Pictures Association of America with their DVD attitude and, and DRM. It's exactly the same kind of thing. Sorry to have made you cry, potentially, but it's good to be on the same page in terms of the realities that schools are currently dealing with. They're getting terribly stressed out about these things. There are solutions, but ignoring the space that they're operating, as in simply install this, not, they can't, maybe, or simply do this, we don't have time. So I'd love to discuss more later, in particularly in our discussion slot, and in the break, of course, about what we can actually do to, to improve matters. But please don't assume that a particular school is unwilling to do something. They're actually rather stuck in the environment they're in at the moment, and they'd love to be somewhere else. They're not unwilling or ignorant, but they need to, you know, we need to actually understand what, what processes they are subject to. Okay? I'll take, let's say, one question, and then we'll, we'll take it into the discussion later in the day. Okay? Anyone? Yes? Ah, yes. 
Okay, the question is, how do I feel about handwriting versus typing and the fact that, that many people don't write much anymore? I'm guilty of this. My handwriting has never been brilliant and it's deteriorated and I've always been a very fast typer. Um, yes, there's now an interesting observation. There are no extensive studies into this, but I've heard from different teachers in primary schools in different states from prep and year one um, that there are now kids coming into primary school who can't hold a pencil properly. Can't hold a pencil or a pen. Any ideas why that might be? Correct. They spent their whole early childhood swiping a screen, particularly iPads. And that is because iPads are the new babysitter. Yeah? Again, I, I'm happy to call things for what they are because that's how they're getting used. I'm not against iPads. However, holding a pencil is still a very important skill in the real world and probably will remain so and should remain so if we learn that early lesson about maybe taking notes on paper is a really good thing. And yes, people are losing that. But that, that comes into a whole other conversation again on why are those kids, why are the three and four year olds on those iPads? That's a whole other conversation that takes it into the home. Let's discuss that later today because we're really out of time. We've got a couple of minutes of leeway, but that'll do for now. Thank you very much.